I repeat to you, gentlemen, that your inquisition is fruitless. Detain me here forever if you will, confine or execute me if you must have a victim to propitiate the illusion you call justice. But I can say no more than I have said already. Everything that I can remember, I have told you with perfect candour. Nothing has been distorted or concealed, and if anything remains vague, it is only because of the dark cloud which has come over my mind. That cloud and the nebulous nature of the horrors that brought it upon me. Written in 1919, the statement of Randolph Carter is based on a dream of Lovecraft's where he and a friend, Samuel Loveman, ventured into an ancient cemetery only for Loveman to disappear down into a crypt and not return. Though only a short story, the statement contains many elements of the shared mythos Lovecraft built into his writings over the course of his career. The titular Randolph Carter is the most famous example. The character would go on to appear in several Lovecraft tales, including The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, The Silver Key, The Case of Charles Dexter Ward, and more. For this reason, many Lovecraft critics believe that Carter is a cipher for Lovecraft himself, and the journey Carter takes in the stories he features in is a reflection of Lovecraft's own literary journey. The tale begins with Carter recounting, under police questioning, how he and his friend Harley Warren travelled to an ancient cemetery on a quest to learn the secrets of what Warren theorised were immortal beings that lay forever in a death-like slumber without being truly dead. The weird studies of Harley Warren were well known to me, and to some extent shared by me. Of his vast collection of strange, rare books on forbidden subjects, I have read all that are written in the languages of which I am a master, but these are few as compared with those in languages I cannot understand. As Carter describes their arcane research, it becomes clear that the relationship between the two is closer to that of mentor and student rather than equals. Carter alludes to Warren's superior knowledge of the occult and foreign languages and even alludes to his fear of Warren's moods. Carter is both intellectually and physically intimidated by Warren. Of Lovecraft's relationship with Loveman, we know little beyond the admiration both had for each other's work, and their correspondence was always glowing so it's doubtful that Lovecraft was intimidated by his friend. It is worth noting, however, that Loveman did in fact own a large collection of rare first edition and early books from medieval times. And it's likely that this fact was the inspiration behind the rare books on foreign subjects Lovecraft describes. Your witness says he saw us at half past eleven on the Gainesville Pike, headed for Big Cypress Swamp. This is probably true, but I have no distinct memory of it. The picture seared into my soul is one of scene only, and the hour must have been long after midnight, for a waning crescent moon was high in the vaporous heavens. As he recounts the tale, it becomes quite clear that Carter follows the trope of the unreliable narrator so common in Lovecraft's work. And as always, it's impossible to know for sure whether he's hiding something or genuinely has little recollection of the events that transpired that night. It was in a deep, damp hollow, overgrown with rank grass, moss, and curious creeping weeds, and filled with a vague stench which my idle fancy associated absurdly with rotting stone. On every hand were the signs of neglect and decrepitude, and I seemed haunted by the notion that Warren and I were the first living creatures to invade a lethal silence for centuries. As Lovecraft describes the scene, death fills the air, and once again time appears as a motif. Both the hour and the location become blurred, and it becomes very difficult to gain a sense of perception as to what is actually happening. After an unknown period of time making mental calculations and standing in the dark, Warren decides that he must act. I'm sorry to have to ask you to stay on the surface, he said, but it would be a crime to let anyone with your frail nerves go down there. You can't imagine, even from what you have read, and from what I have told you, the things I shall have to see and do. Once again Lovecraft hints at the mental student nature of their relationship, 
Warren is keen to ensure that Carter stays in the relative safety of the surface while he journeys down into the unknown of the ancient crypts. It's not clear whether Carter protests out of camaraderie with Warren or if his own morbid curiosity is urging him on. But either way, a dispute ensues between the two until eventually Warren gets his way and Carter is left alone in the dark. Amorphous shadows seem to lurk in the deeper recesses of the weed-choked hollow and to flit as in some blasphemous ceremonial procession past the portals of the mouldering tombs in the hillside. Shadows which could not have been cast by that pallid, peering crescent moon. As Warren ventures down into the tomb, leaving Carter alone in the deep dark of the cemetery, his imagination begins to run wild and his mood darkens. He begins to see strange shadows twist and writhe in the dark corners as the crescent moon hangs high in the sky. The images of shadow creeping in and out of view allude to the sense of paranoia Carter must be feeling as he sits alone in the darkness, and once again casts doubt on the veracity of his recollection. Time begins to slow down, and it becomes harder and harder to rationalise the gap between events as Carter's memory and perception of time begin to blur further. God, if you could see what I'm seeing. I could not answer, speechless I could only wait. Then came the frenzied tones again. Carter, it's terrible, monstrous, unbelievable. Warren's opaque rambling set Carter into a frenzy. His curiosity overpowering any sense of self-preservation, Carter is desperate to know more and calls into the receiver again and again, begging for details. Warren does eventually respond, but as time passes, his tone becomes more and more desperate as the eldritch entities of his investigation turn the tables on the curious interloper. Curse these hellish things, legions, my god, beat it, beat it, beat it. After that was silence. I know not how many interminable aeons I sat stupefied, whispering, muttering, calling, screaming into that telephone. Over and over again through the aeons I whispered and muttered, called and shouted and screamed, Warren, Warren, answer me, are you there? Carter is left alone in the dark muttering to himself, and we are left to wonder how much time has really passed in this long forgotten hollow. Did the horror of the unfolding events break Carter's mind completely, causing him to lose all sense of time? Or is there something else going on? Carter is the only living person to speak of the hollow. Does it really exist in our world? Or is it found in some foreboding parallel dimension? A dimension where time doesn't move forwards as in our plane of existence. I heard it, and knew no more. Heard it as I sat petrified in the unknown cemetery in the hollow, amidst the crumbling stones and the falling tombs, the rank vegetation and the miasmal vapours. Heard it well up from the innermost depths of that damnable sepulchre, as the watched amorphous, necrophagous shadows dance beneath an accursed waning moon. And this is what is said. You fool, Warren is dead. The tale ends with Carter's most horrifying revelation of all. We can't say where the voice came from. Is it an eldritch being? Warren's own shade? Or even a figment of Carter's shattered psyche? Whatever the case, it's enough to break Carter, but not forever. Because this isn't the end for him, but rather only the beginning of his journey into the unknown. For just like Lovecraft, his taste for the cosmic mysteries of the universe is only beginning. He only need take the next step.